Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thanks very much for the very kind invitation. So I will talk about citizen and amateur science today. And uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, to do uh, a little kind of uh, historical tour um, to say a few words about the historical roots and similarities between what we call today citizen science and what was called before that uh, amateur science. And, and so uh, one simple observation, uh, if you look at the history of science, is that uh, the collaborations, the co-production of knowledge between professional scientists and uh, citizens or amateurs uh, is not uh, something which is a recent phenomenon. But since the beginnings of science, there has always been uh, a co-production of knowledge between different kinds of uh, actors and between different kinds of social worlds. So you, we always had uh, scientists or researchers, but also uh, different kinds of amateurs or patients uh, producing knowledge and exchanging uh, regularly with professional scientists. And here on, on this slide you have uh, just a few examples of um, activities and practices where you see a lot of uh, amateurs co-producing knowledge with uh, professional scientists. In natural history, of course, there is a long tradition of amateurs, who, amateurs who go in the field and observe uh, nature, uh, be it in botany or ornithology or other fields. Um, more more recently, you have also uh, had people doing uh, epidemiology, so people who uh, were not professional scientists but who were interested to understand uh, the the causes of certain diseases and and sometimes this was due to to specific pollutions near industrial industrial sites for example and you uh, you also have an, an example of uh, AIDS treatment activists um, who were studied by uh, Stephen Epstein and who are also involved in uh, the production and evaluation of biomedical knowledge and finally, uh, an example from uh, my colleagues at the Center for Sociology of Innovation at Ecole de Mines, who studied the French Association of uh, Muscular Dystrophy, which is an association mainly um, composed by uh, patients themselves and their families, their, their parents or brothers and sisters. And uh, that association is, is quite famous for uh, having launched Teleton, um, but it, it's also involved in scientific research in different kinds of ways by um, really putting on the political agenda certain uh, diseases and, and uh, what you call rare diseases or orphan diseases, but also um, uh, gathering data and uh, sometimes even writing scientific articles with, uh, with, with scientists. So what you see uh, here, if you look at the history and diversity of citizen science, that you have different kinds of uh, disciplinary fields which have historically been open to citizen pr practitioners. Um, natural history, as I said, so botany, zoology, entomology, ornithology. In astronomy, there is also a strong tradition of amateurs collaborating with professionals, epidemiology, etc. So you could look at uh, the history and the dynamics of citizen science in terms of disciplines, but it's also interesting to think about the material spaces, the physicalities, the materialities of citizen science. And if you look at natural history, obviously it's the field where uh, natural uh, people interested in natural history, uh, amateur practitioners, go to do the observation and collect their specimens. Um, the museum is a place where traditionally amateurs and professionals meet. Um, there are also places like pubs or coffee, house, coffee houses, which were historically important. And um, it's, it's the work of uh, uh, Anne Sackert, which is interesting here. And she really looked at the kind of um, the conviviality and the social dimensions of people meeting in uh, coffee houses or pubs rather than institutions. Uh, which, so the pub is more uh, like a, a neutral ground and a more open space than a scientific institution. Um, in, in recent years, there have also been studies um, on people doing science at home, in their kitchens and garages and, and basements. I will come back to that in a second. And uh, since uh, 20 or 30 years, you have a growing number of 
uh, do-it-yourself labs, hacker spaces, fab labs, uh, etc. So I want to, to uh, talk uh, about three examples uh, today. So the first one is uh, do-it-yourself biology or DIY biology, or people also sometimes uh, talk about garage biology. So what is do-it-yourself biology? It's a movement that uh, started around uh, 2008. Um, uh, a website and association was launched called DIY Bio. Uh, today, you've got around 100, a bit more than 100 groups interested in do-it-yourself biology around the world. And there are uh, roughly 50 laboratories uh, which are dedicated to do-it-yourself biology. And as you see on the map on the top uh, left, uh, most groups and labs dedicated to do-it-yourself biology are um, in the ocean. <laughs> Stephanie, help. <laughs> I must say thanks to Stephanie, she helped me a lot. I was uh, visiting professor in Vienna, so uh, I owe you a lot for helping me there, and now you help me here in Paris, so thanks for you, this continuous collaboration. <laughs> 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 so, uh, as you see on that map, um, do-it-yourself biology are, are mainly taking place in the Western world, in European cities and in uh, American cities, East Coast, West Coast, in, in the US in places like San Francisco or New York, or in Europe in places like uh, Paris, Copenhagen, Manchester, etc. What do do-it-yourself biologists do? They do all kinds of different things, um, from producing uh, workarounds, from producing alternatives to scientific equipment, uh, to uh, the DNA barcoding of plants or sushi or meat, uh, in, in France, there was a scandal with lasagna containing horse meat rather than only um, beef. And so one of the activities they did in do the self labs uh, was to do DNA barcoding in, in order to determine if your lasagna contained only, only beef meat. Um, brewing, home brewing to produce beer, for example, that's uh, a classic. Uh, bio art, so it's not only producing science but also about uh, artistical projects, um, as you see on the on the top uh, on the top picture, uh, a lot of uh, efforts also go in into education, outreach, and so inviting, uh, having conferences or invi inviting uh, um, kids um, and schools um, to those those uh, do-it-yourself labs. And one example I wanted to show you. Um, um, a, a lot of efforts go into uh, finding alternatives to scientific equipment. A PCR machine, if you uh, buy a PCR machine, it costs uh, three, four, five thousand uh, euros. And that's obviously quite a, a large sum for amateur practitioners. So one of the alternatives developed by uh, the do-it-yourself biology movement was to create what is called the open PCR machine. And the open PCR machine was developed by two engineers in 2011, and it can be. Uh, you can try also to do the whole thing uh, on on your own. It's it's a bit difficult, but it, it's possible if you have the technical capa capacities. Or uh, you can order the kit, and it costs around six hundred dollars. And so uh, the kit uh, is like what you see on the top, um, on the bottom, uh, on the bottom right. And uh, so the the kit the of the PCR machine, the open PCR machine, is shipped, sent to you. It takes about uh, three, uh, between three and five hours to assemble uh, the machine. Um, with the kit comes um, a booklet of 74 pages, which explains step by step how to assemble, assemble the machine. A bit like a, if you buy a piece of furniture from IKEA, you also have uh, the different pieces, and you have uh, it sometimes takes more than three and four or five hours, and sometimes it creates some. Uh, conflicts in, in couples. I don't know if you've experienced this. Uh, but the thing is, it's the, ex the instructions are, are, are very detailed uh, uh, for people to, to be able to, to assemble uh, this machine. And also it's interesting because it really shows you that if we think about citizen science, you also have got to think about 
the equipment and the materials used to do citizen science. It's not only about opening up data or it's not only about the, the, the simple idea or, or um, the kind of philosophy of bringing people together. You also think about the, the material means in wi which enable or not the, the co-production of, of knowledge. Um, one thing which interested me when, when I started working on do-it-yourself biology was this uh, term yourself. Um, because on the one hand, you see um, the term present and you see pictures and projects and a rationale which says, well, you can on your own do biology at home. But then on the other hand, um, in order to be able to do biology in your garage or basement, um, you depend on different kinds of things. Um, if you want to set up uh, a, a collective, collaborative lab, um, you sometimes do, um, uh, uh, you, you try to, to, to get some money through Kickstarter, for example, or uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang in France. Um, you um, exchange uh, via uh, wikis or online discussions or uh, email, you exchange recipes and ideas uh, and knowledge. Um, sometimes people also uh, get donations from labs or from, from companies. And so it's uh, yourself, but also with, uh, with others. And so if you want to do biology in, in your garage or basement, um, you depend on this infrastructure uh, of people, knowledge, and, uh, and, and things. And so the yourself has to be, in a sense, connected. Um, it has to be part of a wider group. And so that's um, why we can uh, think here about the, the concept by uh, Patrice Flichy, which is the concept of connected individualism. individualism. So uh, between autonomy and between the idea of having networks. And so because of this connectivity, this, this need for connectivity and being member of wider collectives, the term yourself might not be really uh, appropriate. It might seem as a misnomer. But on the other hand, I, I think there is still uh, a sense in using the term yourself uh, because the yourself is not here uh, uh, used in a passive sense, uh, uh, but it's really uh, to show that people, citizens, amateurs, uh, artists, they really want to engage with biology and understand uh, the, the world that surrounds them, but also their, their, their own bodies. And the yourself, in a sense, it's also a political self because um, it is juxtaposed and differentiated uh, um, in order, um, in relation to other sites and, and locales where you produce science. So the yourself, the garage, the basement, uh, the hacker space is often described as some a place which is very different, which has different rules and different rationales and, and different kinds of uh, uh, social environment than a university, uh, a private laboratory, an enterprise. So um, in this sense, uh, we can say that um, the yourself, in do yourself, stands for a, a political form of the self, um, which makes people more knowledgeable and which is, is also related to this idea of uh, really showing that one can do it yourself, that, that it's, it's, it's this idea of, um, and this is maybe the, the, the key message I want to get across, it's this idea of demonstration. And um, because a lot of work, um, if you look at the uh, tutorials being produced, the, the, the wikis, the stories, the posters, etc., around do-it-yourself biology, is about showing that you can, uh, on your own, uh, produce uh, scientific knowledge and that you can understand your lasagna or your diseases uh, in, in, in a better way. And also uh, th this idea of demonstration is it's maybe not something that we are very much used to uh, think about when you think about a citizen science but I think it's important because it also brings uh, it underlines the importance of talking to a different kind of public or some kind of public uh, if you uh, produce knowledge, if you share um, practices, etc., related to your um, 
to your uh, to your science, it's it's really something that you show to people in order to interest people, in order to enroll people. I also wanted to provide you a few examples of what uh, can be called uh, do-it-yourself uh, medicine, um, and there have been uh, uh, over uh, across the, the the past couple of years a, a number of projects related to. Uh, do-it-yourself uh, do yourself medicine. I won't go into much detail here, but um, one example which uh, is much discussed um, is on the bottom uh, left, the Night Scout project. And the, um, the origin of this project is uh, a father who, uh, 10 years ago, he developed um, a computer code in order to access, uh, the, uh, to access remotely uh, the data of the glucose levels of his uh, of his son, and the project was uh, very much discussed in media. It has a Facebook group of more than twenty thousand members, and that's um, yeah, just one of the the examples of uh, what we can call uh, do-it-yourself uh, medicine. Obviously, there are a lot of advantages uh, of uh, these do-it-yourself medicine practices. Uh, it makes um, uh, medicine and healthcare more affordable, more accessible, more transportable, more democratic uh, to, to sum up. Um, but there are also a lot of concerns being, uh, being uh, raised and voiced. Concerns about the risks uh, associated to those uh, exper experiments and devices. Uh, to, uh, concerns about safety, security, regulation. How should you regulate these, uh, these new objects or devices? And um, so roughly you have on the one side you've got a very positive narrative about do-it-yourself medicine where uh, in, in a nutshell uh, the idea is to bring power to the patient but on the other hand there are also critical voices uh, that say that well on the one hand this might seem as more autonomy and, and more liberty but it, it produces also or it also yields some other kind of dependencies uh, etc. And then my third and final example is uh, an example for my current work I'm doing on low tech, uh, low technologies in, in opposition to, to, to high tech. And um, one of the uh, collectives I've been uh, um, observing uh, over the past couple of years is a collective called uh, L'Atelier Paysan, um, which can be translated as a, a peasant uh, workshop. So L'Atelier Paysan is a collective that was um, created about 10 years ago and it has been very active to organize um, workshops uh, for people to be able to construct their own work to work on their farms. But it's also been very active to produce, uh, to draw plans and to produce videos and pictures and stories about those, uh, about those tools. And um, and obviously also those those plans are um, disseminated in in, uh, uh, in open source uh, fashion. With uh, um, you don't see it very clearly, but on the left uh, bottom uh, bottom left, you uh, see a little sign which says Creative Commons CC, and then uh, the exact license of the uh, of those uh, of those plans. And uh, my the the final the the last thing I want to discuss is about tutorials and the efforts that um, a lot of actors who are into uh, low-tech practices put into uh, producing those tutorials. And so here is uh, a, a screenshot of the wiki of uh, the low-tech lab and I sent to Kelly the link of this uh, wiki so it should be circulated somehow in the ether uh, between uh, the people present here. So. Um, what is on this wiki? On this wiki there are instructions uh, to build all kinds of tools uh, from, as you say, as you see, uh, dry toilets to a uh, solar water heater. Um, those um, tutorials are translated into different kinds of languages. Uh, French, obviously, because Low Tech Lab is a French association, but there are also a lot of um, um, tutorials translated into English, Spanish, Italian, German or Portuguese. And so what, if you click on, on those tutorials, uh, what do you see? You see different kinds of 
inscriptions or different kinds of visual representations of uh, the tools. You see uh, videos, which often last between three and four or five minutes, um, which are not very dry or boring videos, but they are often entertaining and interesting. They provide a few, uh, also a few information about the context and, and the people who develop those um, low tags. You see a lot of pictures. Uh, you see uh, a lot of text, which really uh, tells you in a very precise fashion how to produce a low-tech tool. So you see the, the materials in the beginning of the tutorial, you see the, the materials used, the, the screwdrivers, the hammers, etc., uh, the, the, the plastic or the, the, the wood pieces. Um, you see it's almost like a recipe if you want to cook your uh, lasagna or your uh, pasta bolognese, where you see very you see really each step detailed uh, and you see uh, every ingredient and every tool you, you need to use to be able to cook your meal or to produce this, uh, this, this low tech. So every gesture is really described in a very detailed, um, detail, detailed fashion. And um, so what's also interesting, um, if you would compare this uh, tutorial to uh, a notice if you buy uh, um, um, a new computer or you, you, you buy a new phone, you have uh, uh, the instruction that go with it and it's not a very interactive instruction. It's, it's quite dry and dull and, and, and boring. And whereas on the tutorials you see also the, um, um, the materialization of the whole community around low-tech tools. You see at the end, you see uh, a discussion forum where people can command and they can um, suggest uh, improvements. You often have the second, the third, or the fifth version of a, of a, um, a tool being uh, being on the uh, the wiki. So it's something which is dynamic, which something which is interactive. It's something which is also criticized. Uh, some of the comments um, and the questions raised uh, at the bottom of these uh, tutorials say that well, you could maybe exchange uh, a few uh, elements, and this is not very. Um, sustainable and, and, and so that it's a quite inter interactive mode of, of producing and, and sharing um, knowledge. So um, again one word uh, I want you to think about is the idea of documentation and um, so the main message is that if you think about citizen science you should not only think about the funding streams or the spaces or the disciplines etc. You also have to think about how and where and with what kind of tools do you document citizen science. And, and this documentation is important because it, um, the term documentation is quite a broad uh, term. So, um, and we really need to unpack and think what goes into documentation. So it's about, the, the slide I'll just show you is about filming and about editing and um, choosing the right angles when you film. It's about um, um, assembling pictures. Uh, it's about writing text, which is understandable, engaging. Uh, it's about drawing, etc. And it's, so it's about mobilizing different kinds of um, practices and materialities in order to document um, uh, a technological uh, a tool. And so um, documents are, are important because they, they really give life to, um, to, those, uh, to, to those tools. So um, in conclusion, in, in four steps, um, the, the I started off with um, saying a few words about the history of citizen science and amateur science. And so um, citizen science takes place in specific or also across specific disciplinary fields and physical locations. Um, citizen science is not only about um, producing knowledge, it doesn't only have entail an epistemic, epistemic dimension, but also it's about um, doing politics, to put it um, simply. Um, collaboration, if you think about collaboration, you have got to think about infrastructure, and um, infrastructure or infrastructuring. I think yesterday evening um, you talked about infrastructuring. And um, so think about the, um, the wikis, the mails, the sharing of knowledge, etc., which make citizen science uh, possible. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, I wanted to think about uh, things which might seem very ordinary and very simple, but I think which are very important in the daily lives and practices of citizen science, which are demonstration, which means, again, showing that you can do it to an audience, and documentation, which means assembling different kinds of materialities, pictures, videos, etc., into a space which people can access in order to build their own uh, tools to do citizen science. And with that, I'll leave you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, to my great shame, I realized I forgot to properly <laughs> introduce you <laughs> at the beginning, and I will do that now, well, now that there are more people here. Um, so Morgan is research director at the French C CNRS and works at the so Center of Sociology of Innovation at Mines Paris. Paris. Yeah. And why we uh, invited you is because you have been working in this field for decades now, which is like not, uh, that you, you, have, you have all the credentials and you were, um, had this wonderful focus on what we have been discussing here a lot. How do we document? How do we report? What is valuable to report and in what contexts? And then of course documentation practices. Um, so thank you so much for your input. And we have time I think for three questions. So please, uh, the people with the microphones are around here, show by hand. Um, if you have a question, if you want to dive into something, Barbara, please, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't have so much a question, but rather thank you for bringing this to the conference here because I also work a lot with makerspaces and we have similar platforms where on the one hand for open healthcare products that's called Carables, where documentation is of course always an issue and things get improved and so on. And then there's others like we had critical making where we have you know lots of people documenting what they make, for example, in refugee camps and so on. So there's so much great stuff going out there, doing uh, people there and I think it's not so much Pro, uh, my perception, not so much yet matched with the citizen science community. I mean, some sensor building or so on, but I'd just like to thank you for bringing up those examples because I think they're also, you know, to raise more awareness of what's, what's going on there with people doing these kind of DIY stuff in the, in the broadest sense. So thank you. Thanks. Give you? I will, I will give you mine. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks also for that interesting talk. I was wondering, so in my experience, even professionals consistently struggle with good documentation. Um, I think <laughs> all of my work experience has shown me that people find this really hard. Um, and while I totally agree with you that it is necessary, I wonder what resources are out there. So if, if it's so complicated, even for professionals who are paid to do this sort of thing, how can we enable citizen scientists and people who support citizen science to make good documentation? How can we enable this happening if it is so complicated? The, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point. Um, the the low-tech lab, for example, uh, produced a document called Le Tuto des Tutos, the tutorial of uh, tutorials, in a sense, the mother of tutorials, and it really uh, it explains step by step how to what makes a, a good tutorial, um, um, how do you write, how do you make paragraph understandable and not have sentences that are too long, um, how do you structure the tutorial, when you film, what you've got to think about, how to zoom, what to focus. Um, often they say oh, you, you've got to produce two two videos. One video about the actual making of a tool and the other um, video about the general political, social, economic context of why this tool was produced in that specific place. And you've got so also um, sometimes, uh, you've got also instructions uh, and, and details about how you produce um, drawings like this, how do you represent, or how sometimes you see pictures and on that picture you've got uh, a note which says, well, this is that um, part or this, this, this element. So, and, and you see the same for uh, L'Atelier Paysan, uh, they also produce document um, um, which details, uh, so it has become, in a sense, it has become a method. Tutorials has become a method, but apart from those two uh, documents, which are really when I uh, when I really uh, came across them, I was really really happy because that was like um, 
uh, then the, really the method being made very visible and very clear. And also uh, the method is also um, made available in order for other people. It's not only the members, the, the key members of the low tech lab or that les paysans, but it's also uh, a call for other people to produce documentation. But I, I think I think yes, for scientists it's difficult, but maybe for scientists it's a bit easier because I think the rules of the game are maybe a bit clearer and there's more instructions. And if you just think about the an academic paper, it's it's um, the introduction, uh, materials and method research questions. It's very structured and it's very compact and it it uh, has a a, um, a word limit, etc. And these kinds of very clear instructions that are not that uh, that visible, and 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 finally also w one important problem is the problem of time or it documentation being sometimes perceived as very um, useless or boring, and and people who are engaging in citizen science they do this often in the evenings or in weekends. They have they maybe have other kinds of occupational professions, and so um, they want to do the stuff. They don't don't want to end up hours and writing what they've done and filming etc. So it comes as an extra, and that makes it maybe more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Final question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question regards the motivation that is behind uh, the people in engaging with citizen science and in your opinion, uh, because I always thought that the main reason was an epistemical one, so people want to understand better reality, but for many cases that you show, uh, it looks like people want a different goal perhaps, so they want to be able to do stuff, to grow their yogurt or to clean their water. So perhaps the dimension is, rather than epistemical, is you know a technical power that they want to achieve. And I was just wondering whether these two dimensions go together, in your opinion, or there's sometimes conflict perhaps, or one, is stronger than the other. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. I think there are different kinds of motivation and rationales. And um, um, one rationale or motivation is yes, knowledge and gaining knowledge and producing knowledge and, and, and sharing knowledge. So the epistemic dimension is important and is there. But um, if you ask people and you observe people uh, doing uh, do it yourself biology or, or involved in do it yourself uh, low tech labs, you also hear a lot of uh, discussion about fun and conviviality and be uh, really liking uh, activities with others who are also um, interested and motivated. So it's, the, the, it's, it's about being able to do experimenting and not having to, um, yes, run after a deadline or run after a publication, etc. So it's about um, freedom and, and having fun uh, doing, doing the stuff. And um, in, uh, there, there can be conflicts, uh, yeah, there can be conflicts because one of the, um, the, the tensions um, in the low-tech lab, for example, is that a lot of people who do uh, low-techs, they are engineers and they know already how to drill and how to uh, melt metal or how to do some kind of practical work. Um, whereas the the wider public is not necessarily used to 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 do stuff and to 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 create uh, stuff, and so it's attention they're very much aware of this because on on the one hand, um, what they do and and those instructions they are for users, um, but there is also the idea to talk to wider public, and so this this can be a contrast to uh, talking to a, a wider set of a public of users who want to reproduce tools and. Uh, sensibilizing, um, motivating a, wi a wider public of the idea and the necessity, necessity of, of doing uh, this kind of stuff. And so, um, uh, yeah, one, one, one final word about uh, motivation is people who do low-tech um, are, are often um, narrating their interest in a very um, philosophical or ecological manner. Uh, it's, it's like a um, a new modern kind of adventure. It's about um, being uh, having a close relationship with the environment, with with nature, and so it's uh, yes, it's uh, I would say it's a political, philosophical, ecological positioning uh, of the people. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Margaret. Do you still want to?
Thank you. Um, I share Barbara's enthusiasm for maker spaces and hacker spaces and make um, so many things I wanted to respond to that you shared with today. A, a quick share of the DITOS project, which is also shares this ethos about yourself. It stood for Do It Together Science. Some of the people that were involved in that project are here in the room, and it's a lovely crossover between um, hacking and making and citizen science. But I want to ask you, um, actually, a bit of a follow-on on something that Barbara mentioned, this concept of sharing how to make it and then setting that free, either on GitHub or Creative Commons or platforms like this or Instructables. And then people riff off of that, do developments, do improvements. Have you seen something emerging that allows a, a kind of referencing of what went before, but also finding of the improvement? I'm thinking of the academic parallel where we cite each other and platforms like Crossref allow you to see cross citations and watch something getting built on that you also see your own work getting built on. Is there something similar emerging on that kind of ongoing development of stuff that's been set free? Yeah, no, I haven't seen anything anything like that. Um, um, there is, I think, probably also because it's, it's a much more recent phenomenon, this idea of infrastructuring uh, collaboration and 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 really taking documentation uh, seriously and uh, what the whole the low tech lab did was um, they they embarked on a ship for six years and they they toured the whole world in order to um, experiment but also really document low techs uh, uh, across the world and um, and they said well the, the problem with a lot of those tools and and practices is that they are not known to the wider world and they are interesting solutions to to local and in pressing pressing problems and um, and there is an effort to um, build uh, databases and yeah the example of instructables uh, is is, uh, is an important that's an important reference point which comes up in do it yourself biology uh, low tech etc but I haven't seen anything like uh, cross ref or, or citations uh, etc no not yet